It's, it's the food. It is so, you know, it is it's so hard for people to get their minds wrapped around it because we've gotten so much education from food industry, from the drug companies, from the doctor businesses and so on that have taught us to not look to food to the cause and solution of our problems, but it's so obvious. I mean, if you were a farmer, you were growing crops, would you be concerned about the soil? So as a doctor, I'm concerned about the soil. I wanna know that you're being grown the right way and food is basically everything. You know, even, even problems like lung cancer have a relationship to food and skin cancers and all kinds of problems are related to food, at least in part. What I'd like to talk to you about is hypertension, high blood pressure. And this is the, the frank discussion that your doctor should be having with you if you have concerns about your blood pressure. Probably you know that high blood pressure leads to strokes, doesn't lead to heart attacks, leads to heart failure. And what we're gonna discuss is the fact that high blood pressure is really not a disease. It's a sign of underlying sickness in the body. Now we could take care of it with drugs or we could take care of it with diet, but there's only really one way to take care of it correctly. And that is you must deal with the food because that's the cause. Uh, an article I just recently read called Timeline of History of Hypertensive Treatment. Interesting discussion about high blood pressure. And what they noted in there was that it was written in 2016, this particular article was. They said that it is surprising that only about 50 years ago, hypertension was considered an essential malady. In other words, something kind of to be expected and not a treatable condition. And the first drugs that were introduced were the diuretics, the thiazide diuretics, and they were introduced in the late 1950s. So, you know, my 54 years of practicing medicine, I've been exposed to this study by study, treatment recommendation by treatment recommendations. I, I've followed this all along in real time. And I'd like to share with you what I've learned and what I've come to understand about high blood pressure. Your blood pressure is something you can measure. <clears throat> and again, they've only been measuring it for about 50 years. Just when I started practicing medicine came the technology to do that. And that's what they, uh, a, a stethoscope and uh, a blood pressure cuff. Now, one thing I, you wanna note from the beginning is that the blood pressures you get at home are the ones that doctors should be counting on. Not, not the blood pressures you get in a doctor's office. Too often you're, you're excited, you're afraid, afraid, you're anxious, and your blood pressure is artificially raised in that kind of office setting. So when you go to manage your blood pressure, uh, whether it's uh, to see whether or not you have the condition or if you're in the process of treating it with diet or drugs, you wanna take the measurements at home, write them down, discuss what you find with your private medical doctor. I think once a day is enough. I mean, if you're a healthy person, maybe, maybe once a year you should check your blood pressure. But if you're uh, ill with problems, uh, particularly those related to high blood pressure, then you know, don't check it five times a day or 10 times a day. Once a day is plenty. Your morning reading is going to be your highest reading. So on average, so throughout the day, your blood pressure generally comes down. The uh, measurement of high blood pressure is something very convenient and relatively inexpensive these days. You could go to uh, uh, most pharmacies and you could buy a blood pressure cuff, an automatic one, where you don't have to use a stethoscope. And they cost between 20 and $75. Now, let me take a minute and uh, tell you how this works and what we're listening to and what it means. Uh, you see the picture of the arm here and uh, uh, something labeled the brachial artery. If you put the cuff around the arm above the brachial artery, like you see positioned here, and then you blow up the cuff and you listen with a stethoscope over that brachial artery, what will happen is the sound of the blood flow will disappear. And that's because the artery is completely closed, so no blood gets through it. And then you start decreasing the pressure in the cuff and eventually you reach the highest pressure in the system where the blood can finally get through the brachial artery and you hear the slapping sound when you put the stethoscope just distal to the cuff over the brachial artery, it slaps. Blum, 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 blum. 
something like that. And then what happens is you continue to lower your cuff pressure is you reach a pressure, the lowest pressure, which is diastolic. The lowest pressure is when the blood vessels no longer slap together. They're constantly open because you've reached the lowest pressure in the system. And that's what blood pressure is. It's a reading of the highest and the lowest pressure in the system. It's easily, easily monitored, easily measured, safely measured. The only problem is what you do with the information. Then you can get into trouble or get out of trouble. Now, as far as readings go, I would say pretty much a, a normal blood pressure would be considered a 100 to 110 over maybe 70 to 80. That, those are generally the figures. And, and those are typical of Americans, which are in general sick people. If you look at other populations, for example, you look at uh, rural Africans still living on a starch-based diet, you'll find their blood pressures will run you know, 70 or 80 over 30 or 40 millimeters of mercury. And of course, they're in excellent health. As the system becomes ill, which is what causes the blood pressure to go up, as the cardiovascular system becomes ill, the numbers you get when you check with a outrig like uh, what we have right here, a blood pressure cuff and a sphygmomometer, the pressures go up. And a high blood pressure might be considered 180 over 120. Actually, I would consider that malignant hypertension, which needs uh, you know, pretty prompt treatment, malignant hypertension does. And then as you get a better readings, uh, we still consider those high blood pressure, like say 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. A again, considering a normal pressure being 100, 110 over say 70, 80 millimeters of mercury. And that's what they tell you here is a normal blood pressure is uh, 120 over 80. Those are the kinds of numbers that you'll be getting. And again, remind yourself through this lecture that a very, very high blood pressure is 120 over 100, excuse me, 180 over 120 millimeters of mercury. Uh, how common is high blood pressure? Well, you know, at least 20% of the population has high blood pressure. And one piece of data that I read, 40% of people over the age of 25 have an elevated blood pressure. And this is a major risk factor for the condition of your arteries. This is not a disease. It's a sign of the condition of the arteries. People don't die of high blood pressure. You know, in my whole career of 54 years, I've never seen anybody die of high blood pressure. In fact, the only thing I can imagine that it would look like death by high blood pressure would be a reflection of a movie I saw in 1981 called Scanners, where aliens, they, uh, with to, to telemetry, they, they would get us native people on earth all excited and we'd shake and eventually our heads would explode. I mean, is that what dying of high blood pressure is like? If it is, I've never seen it. It's a silent disease, so to speak. That's the only thing I could picture is that Scanners movie, if people actually died from elevated blood pressure. It would be an ugly thing. Uh, why does the blood pressure go up? Because it's supposed to. It's a normal reaction that the body has. It's a, an adjustment that it makes as the cardiovascular system becomes ill, sick. And that's due to the food. And the ser most serious manifestations of this sickness of the cardiovascular system would be a failure in the brain, in other words, a stroke, or a failure in the heart. Well, that might be a heart attack, but more commonly it would be heart failure. In 1985, I published a book called McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion. And I worked for six years to put that book together. And fortunately, many years later, I could tell you that there's not a word I'd correct in that book. It's, it's an excellent discussion of medicine up until that time. But the, the important thing for you to understand is very little has changed since 1985. And in my chapter on high blood pressure, by the way, you can have this book for free. Yeah, all you do is you just go to our website, you go to the to our shop, you know, where, where you buy things and you enter this particular book and there are a few others of them that I own. And when you get to checkout, yeah, there's no charge. We, you can download it for free. 
anyway, in the chapter on high blood pressure, what I say is the blood pressure goes up because of excitement. Like if you're afraid when you go to the doctor's office or if you exercise or you drop a bowling ball on your foot. Due to excitement, the pump pumps harder and faster and the pressure goes up. Well, this isn't associated with any bad health, is it? The other reason the blood pressure would go up would be is if you overfill the system with fluid. And what we're talking about here is eating a lot of salt. When you eat a lot of salt, that brings in water into the cardiovascular system and that causes the blood pressure to go up. And that's of some importance and it gives you also something to do. You can go on a low salt diet to help with your elevated blood pressure. There's something even more important than that. And that's the, uh, the last drawing that I put in this book back in 1985. That's about peripheral resistance. And that's the important thing. And that's what we're gonna be talking about is the blood vessels become narrowed and the blood becomes viscous. And as a consequence, we create peripheral resistance, which causes the pressure to go up. It's like when you're out watering flowers and you decide you want to water something 10, 15, 20 feet away, but you don't want to walk over there. What do you do? You put your thumb over the end of the hose. You increase the resistance to flow and the pressure goes up. That's what high blood pressure is measuring is the resistance of flow in your cardiovascular system. A part of that resistance to flow has to do with atherosclerosis. We have the pipes and the pipes get diseased. It's called atherosclerosis. And the walls get thickened and you develop pustules and scar and calcium and all kinds of things that narrow the lumen of your arteries throughout your entire body. We're talking about 60,000 miles of vessels and many of them are larger vessels and you can see this change that occurs. So as life goes on for the typical American who eats the rich Western diet, you have narrowing of your arteries. Of course, fortunately, you can reverse this. You eat a good diet and you show regression of the arteries and the, the pipes open up a bit. The other thing that causes the uh, the arteries to narrow is, are spasms. These are made of muscles, these arteries are. And there are certain things that we eat like bad cholesterol that cause the artery walls to go into spasm. Again, increasing peripheral resistance. And then there's this, this thing that we do three, four times a day that increases peripheral resistance. We cause the blood to become viscous. It's sludging of the blood. And you see here the flow of blood, very rapid. In this situation before a meal, the blood cells hit and bounce off each other. They negatively repel each other so you have a good flow. And then you feed the fat. And what happens is this, you see the blood cells now stick together. There's all kinds of sludge. You can see the tremendous increase in peripheral resistance that occurs. One thing I wanna point out here is that vegetable fat, you know, your health food vegetable fats, they cause more severe sludging and more prolonged sludging of the blood than do animal fats. And this sludging lasts uh, six, eight, 10 hours a day. Well, the typical American eats a, one high fat meal after another every three or four hours. So their blood is constantly in this viscous state. We see this in, in human experiments. Uh, for example, you see the, the setup here with a microscope, uh, the doctors looking in the whites of the eye of a apparently 44 year old fireman. And you see a picture of the blood vessels of the white eye on the left there. And you can see there's lots, lots of blood flow, very relaxed blood vessels. And then the high fat meal is fed. This is 67% of the calories is fat. Typical meal that I've eaten, that many of you have eaten in the past. The oxygen, what we call oxygen tension or oxygen content in the blood drops 20% after a single high fat meal due to poor circulation. So uh, sounds like high blood pressure is bad because it hurts the arteries. I would understand if you went to that, uh, that conclusion is, uh, you know, pressures are pressures and, you know, they cause damage and stretching and so on. And normal blood pressure being 120 over 80, as the pressure goes up, we have, see an increased risk of dying of heart disease. And we come to the, uh, the, the logical, although incorrect, conclusion that what is happening 
is the pressure itself is damaging the arteries. No, it's 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 backwards. It's it's the heart before the the horse before the cart type thing. And healthy weightlifters, double leg presses. If you measure their blood pressure while they're lifting the weights, their blood pressure goes up on average to 320 over 250 millimeters of mercury. And in one subject in this particular paper, the blood pressure went to 480 over 350 millimeters of mercury. Not a single blood vessel breaks. Healthy blood vessels don't break. Please understand this. Well, let me take it a little bit further. In, in this particular experiment, uh, investigators, they used a custom made motorized syringe to raise the pressure in cadaver arteries. They took arteries from 10 people who died, fresh arteries, and they uh, put their their syringe pump into one end of the artery, closed off the other, and raised the blood pressure in the arteries, for example, in the aorta, which is the big blood vessel in the, in the central part of the body. They raised the blood pressure to 3,000 millimeters of mercury before the blood vessel broke. And in, in medium-sized blood vessels like those that are present in your brain circulation, your cerebral arteries, the average blood pressure that would cause a, a rupture in the artery wall was 1,786 millimeters. Healthy blood vessels don't break. You know, probably the extreme of putting pressure on blood vessel walls is when the cardiologist goes in with their catheter and they blow up a balloon and the vessel walls don't break, yet they blow the balloon up to a pressure of 12,000 millimeters of mercury. Healthy vessels don't break. High blood pressure does not cause damage to the vessels. High blood pressure is a reflection of the health of the vessels. When your pressure goes up, you're talking about your circulation being sick. You're talking about the heart, the blood vessel walls, and the blood itself being unhealthy. And as a result, you die from the consequence of unhealthy arteries, not the pressure. Let's, let's do a little summary here. Uh, here you see a large opening where well, you begin with a black arrow. You begin with a, a large opening and you have very strong vessel walls. And then as life goes on, you cause progressive damage to the walls. And what happens is they, they enlarge and they close the lumen. So the lumen becomes a, a smaller diameter, increasing the peripheral resistance. The pressure goes up as a consequence of the arteries becoming sicker. And eventually they get to a point where they're so sick that we have rupture of plaques that cause heart attacks and strokes. And we talked about this in our, our, our lecture on heart disease about how you have a heart attack from plaque rupture. And most strokes are also due to plaque rupture. You see that right here. Let's see if we can find a picture. Yeah, what happens is the postule breaks, all right? So the, the rotten arteries, they fail. And it, at the time they fail, the blood pressure is up because the arteries are so sick. All right, so you should understand by now that high blood pressure is not the culprit. High pressure, blood pressure is a sign of the health of the arteries. Well, okay, the body naturally regulates the blood pressure. It has, to, it has to go up because the heart has to deliver blood and nutrients to the tissues. And we have that increased peripheral resistance to deliver the oxygen, to deliver the nutrients, to, to take away the waste products. In order to do that, the system has to raise the blood pressure. It's normal, it's natural. And the body regulates the blood pressure just perfectly fine until you start introducing drugs. And then what you do is you paralyze the cardiovascular system in various places. And as a consequence, you, you develop abnormally low blood pressures. I mean, normal would be the blood pressure would be up, right? To try and compensate for all the disease. 
you give a drug to lower the blood pressure. Well, we just talked about how the blood pressure is not the problem. Okay, the, the blood pressure elevation is the result of the problem. So you interfere as we do in the medical business and you cause the blood pressure to go down with medication. Now, what we're gonna talk about here is only a circumstance where people are on medications. I don't care how low your blood pressure goes if you're not taking medications, as long as you're not sick, you know, as long as you're not injured and bleeding to death. It's normal, it's natural. The blood pressure will go low to levels where the bottom number may be 50, 60, 70, the top number may be 70, 80, 90. And it's normal and it's not, it's safe, it's just fine. As long as you're not causing it to go low with medication. Let me uh, explain to you what happens here. Uh, this is a, a look at the systolic blood pressure, so the top number, in relation to dying, overall mortality. And you see here the top number, remember the top number is 110 or 100 or maybe as high as 120. You see up here, very high top numbers in the 220, 240 range. That indicates a very sick cardiovascular system and these people have very high risk of uh, dying of congestive heart failure or having a stroke. Well, in this case where you're dealing with these very, very high blood pressures, if you lower the blood pressure with medication, in other words, you lower it artificially, and you lower it down to about 140 millimeters of mercury, you see a reduction in risk of dying. And this is important. And this is where the, the medical profession can, can have some bragging rights because when blood pressure pills were initially, initially used, they were used for people who had malignant hypertension. These are people that were very, very sick. It was a study called the veteran study and they gave them diuretics and they saw that they reduced the risk of sudden death and congestive heart failure. All right, so you lower the blood pressure with medication down to, we're talking about the top number, remember, down to around 140. If you lower it further than that, say down to 120, 180, 60, you increase your risk of dying. Overtreating high blood pressure is harmful with medications. One thing that happens is you have an increased risk of fractures and falls. The other thing is, is that you're, you're working against the body's normal reaction to a diseased cardiovascular system. In other words, your heart and lungs, or excuse me, your heart and brain need some extra pressure because they're all clogged up, right? Well, you go in with the drugs and you start lowering the pressure and now the perfusion pressure to critical organs like the brain and the heart have been compromised. And so you have an increased risk of stroke and heart attack by artificially lowering the blood pressure. And here you see it in terms of the top number, systolic pressure. You know, three or four times is great. Your chance of having a heart attack when you get down here to a blood pressure of 60, which many of you consider normal and some of your doctors try and get you to do to lower your pressure down to 60 or 70 or 80 with the drugs, you know, the more the better. We've got to try and make you normal. Well, when you, when you do that and you pass, say in this case, the top number down 140 down, to the top number being say 80, 90 or 100, you increase your risk of strokes by two times. The risk of dying of heart attacks is increased by four times. And here it is in terms of looking at the bottom number. You see the same, what we call J-shaped or U-shaped curve of mortality. In other words, you take care of very sick people. In this case, they're talking about the bottom number being higher than 100. You start giving your medication and you lower the bottom number here to around 80 to 90. And this is, this is the, the bottom of the trough. This is when you see reductions in stroke and congestive heart failure up until about say 80 or 90. And then as you aggressively treat the blood pressure and you over treat the blood pressure, what happens when you get down to normal, say 70 or super normal, say 60, you increase the risk of strokes by 200%, the risk of heart attacks by as much as 400%. It should make sense to you, the heart and the brain need to have a flow of blood that's adequate. And these drugs artificially reduce the perfusion fresh pressure to these 
critical organs. Overtreatment is dangerous. So what's the, what's the sweet spot? What's, what's the target for lowering blood pressure? As a doctor, I have to take care of people who have elevated blood pressure and I don't want to undertreat them and I don't want to overtreat them. And so what I use as a uh, target is about a blood pressure of 150 over 90. All right. It would be too high. In other words, they need more medication if the blood pressure was say 160 over 100. And I'd be overtreating if the blood pressure was below 140 over 80. So this is what your doctor should be treating you for a target blood pressure where you have the least chance of having a stroke or heart attack. And that number happens to be on average 150 over 90 millimeters of mercury. You do not want to be treated to a normal level, not with drugs. All right, let's take a look at recommendations for major organizations and see how that fits in with what I just tried to tell you. Uh, the Cochrane Collaboration. The Cochrane Collaboration involves 40,000 experts, scientists, doctors from around the world. And they're in over 100 countries. And they're the most respected organization when it comes to looking for unbiased information. I rely on them a lot. And the Cochrane Collaboration, when they reviewed the treatment of high blood pressure, what they said is treating patients to lower than standard blood pressures. In other words, 140 to 160 over 90 to 100 does not reduce mortality or sickness. Morbidity is illness. So, so they say you, you should not lower the blood pressure below, say 160 to 140, and the, the bottom number being 90 to 100, which you know fits in with the, the target that I just showed you. Uh, the uh, British guidelines which came out originally in 2004 and they still hold today. They say that you shouldn't start treating a person with high blood pressure with medication unless their blood pressure is sustained. That means for months at 160 over 100 or greater because there's no benefit. The Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, uh, they come up with some recommendations every few years on with their ex expert panels, uh, the, this is the eighth, which is the most recent joint national committee on recommendations of what we should treat with medication now, people with high blood pressure. And what they say is this, this is the newest guidelines. They say people younger than 60, you should treat them to a blood pressure of 140 over 90 or higher. Somebody my age, on, at 60 years of age, they've upped the number recently. They used to say even people who are older should be treated to say 140 over 80. They now say that the goal, the target should be on medication, a blood pressure of 150 over 90 or higher, not lower, or higher. So the explanation I gave you for what you ought to do with blood pressure medications is consistent with what your doctors are being told they should do as far as treating you. Unfortunately, doctors are influenced by a lot of things and they're too often not in your best interest. So we have uh, ways of lowering blood pressure <clears throat> and uh, they were introduced uh, in the late 50s you know, when, when I was you know, a young doctor. And these are various medications and the medications fall into five classes. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on these with you. There are diuretics and they work by poisoning the kidneys and causing the kidneys to lose fluid. Poison is the correct terminology. Poisons disrupt the normal body functions through chemical reactions. I'm not I'm just saying this for, for its emotional value. This is the right word, poison. <laughs> Beta blockers, they poison the heart muscle, so it becomes weak. In fact, people on beta blockers, they'll often complain that they can't walk upstairs because their muscles are so weak. So beta blockers, uh, they block the adrenaline, which is a, a powerful hormone that causes the heart to beat strongly. 
And in that way, they weaken the heart and they lower the blood pressure. ACE inhibitors, they're one of the poisons that affect the ad adrenal output and the hormones. They prevent the production of angiotensin II, which is a hormone which constricts the blood vessels and raises the pressure. So ACE inhibitors, they're poisons of the adrenal gland. Angiotensin receptor blockers, they work at another level as far as the adrenal system goes. They block the, the action, not just the production, the action of this powerful hormone angiotensin II. They're not the same drugs. Doctors will often interchange them, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. They're different medications with different risks. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then there are calcium channel blockers, which are poisons that poison the, the, the blood vessels so they relax. So you, you poison the system at various areas and often you, you poison the system three or four or five different ways. And what happens is you artificially decrease the perfusion pressure to the brain and the heart and you increase your risk of dying if you treat too aggressively. Now let's talk about how I treat my patients with high blood pressure. I use the drug that was first tested, and the only one really that we can substantiate works to reduce the risk of stroke and heart failure. The drug I use is called chlorothaladone. It was introduced in the late 50s. It's not the same as hydrochlorothiazide. I know you think it is because they're both diuretics. It's not the same. It was chlorothaladone, which this paper was uh, was a result of it was major outcomes in high risk hypertensive patients randomized to angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, calcium channel blockers versus diuretics by chlorothaladone. And guess what? It was the chlorothaladone that worked and the others didn't. But there are a couple of papers here you might want to read. And I know many of you are going to go back and watch this presentation and look up the studies and see whether or not I presented them to you accurately and without exaggeration. And you'll find that uh, there's darn good evidence for you to be treated with chlorothaladone as opposed to hydrochlorothiazide. That's what I use, and there are reasons why. I don't use calcium channel blockers. And the main reason is adjusted risk ratio for myocardial infarction of our heart attacks was increased by about 60% among users of cal calcium channel blockers. So you add these calcium channel blockers to the system and you increase your risk of dying of heart disease, which is what you're trying to accomplish is not die of heart disease. I think these drugs should never be used. They increase your chances of suicide by fivefold. They cause you to be constipated. They're associated with a risk of overall cancer and specifically breast cancer. No reason to use this kind of medication. Well, there is a reason of course, because you know, they're brand name now, but they came out as, uh, excuse me, they're generic now, but they came out as brand name drugs. So what happens is we have the original medications, which are a brand name, we can charge a lot of money for them. And then they become generic and not that they lose their, their benefits, but you, they get pushed aside for the new brand name drug, which you can charge exorbitant amounts of money for. And that's how new medications become popular. It's not that the old medications don't work. It's just they're not as profitable. So I never prescribe calcium channel blockers and I never prescribe angiotensin receptor blockers. Remember, I told you that your doctors often confuse ACE inhibitors, which stop the production of uh, angiotensin II and uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, which prevent the hormone from acting at the tissue level. Now, doctors think these are the same medications. In fact, they think that ARBs are better, angiotensin receptor blockers, because they don't cause the troublesome side effect of coughing as much. So likely you've been switched from ACE inhibitors to angiotensin re block, re receptor blockers, but not in my practice, you wouldn't be, because I don't use this drug. So uh, sick people take medications. Let's get down to it. Healthy people don't. 
And you, you want to do what you can to safely get off any medications you're on. In this case, we're talking about getting off blood pressure medications. This is how I do it with my patients. I get them to change their diet. They check their blood pressures at home. They need to be pre prepared for a precipitous drop in blood pressure. I mean, you stop the, the viscous nature of the blood, the blood slush, sludging, and in a matter of hours, you decrease peripheral resistance. So be prepared. You may end up with a really low blood pressure really quickly. And what that means, you have to lower your doses of medication so you don't become hypotensive, get in an accident, you know, fall over and hurt yourself. You want to avoid hypotension, too low a blood pressure. So you check your blood pressure in the morning because that's where it's going to be the highest. And you exercise a little bit, but not too much. You know, you should not start an intensive exercise program until you've established a good diet. There are many reasons for this that we could talk about. Uh, you, I reduce medications one at a time. Often people come in with a whole bag full of drugs and they'll be taking multiple doses of the different high blood pressure pills. And so I start with what I think are the most dangerous, which would be the calcium channel blockers and the angiotensin receptor blockers. And we just plain and simple stop those because they're just too darn dangerous. And then what I'll do is I'll slowly reduce the other medications that the patient is on. Maybe cut the dose in half uh, every three or four days, maybe quicker. You know, if their blood pressures are coming down quite quickly, I'll often stop the medication all of a sudden. And you could do that with blood pressure lowering medications, except for maybe beta blockers. Beta blockers, you may want to stop, stop a little bit slowly because the body adapts to beta blockers. And, you know, at the very least, when you stop them rapidly, you might get a rapid heartbeat that could be troublesome to you, at least worry you. So otherwise, you know, I have no hesitation at all stopping these medications. And of course, I have a lot of experience doing this, having done it for close to 50 years. I feel very comfortable about doing it. So we, uh, we reduce one medication at a time, maybe cut it in half every three or four days. If the blood pressure is lower than 150 over 90, then I get a little bit more aggressive at reducing the medications. But whatever you do, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you're being overtreated and you end up with the blood pressure so low that you get in an auto accident or you fall over and hurt yourself. It's safer to have too high a blood pressure than too low a blood pressure. I know that's hard for people who believe so much in drugs, but when you're managing medications and trying to get people off, you have to be aware of the consequences and, and make the right moves. And by the way, this is not difficult. You know, I, I, I teach doctors, we, we had as many as seven doctors working for us at uh, the clinic when we used to take care of companies like Whole Foods and, and other, other companies that came and brought their employees to us. I had as many as seven physicians that worked with me. Now, all of these were really good doctors, of course, board certified physicians. But I could teach them how to reduce the medications in like five minutes. I'd give them a sheet on what I thought they had to do with medications and they'd read it over and they'd use their own judgment. But pretty much by and large, they would, they, would, they would do this and find out the patients turned out really, really well. So it wouldn't be hard for your physician to learn how to take you off medications. But the difficulty is in the fact that we have no education on reducing medications. Doctors don't know how to do it. In fact, they're taught by the drug companies to never do it. You're told, the doctor is told, and you're told by the doctor, and once you're on these medications, you're on for life. I mean, think about it. Yeah, you are on for life unless you fix the problem, which is the food. But if you decide to go that route, then you're going to have to have somebody supervise, give you a little hint on how to reduce your medications. No, it's not that there haven't been many people who have done this without medical supervision. It's just that I have to advise, of course, that you have a competent, trained healthcare provider helping you make the decisions. What do you do with the extra drugs? You know, most of my patients start up with a whole bathroom cabinet full of medications and they don't need to take them. Now we get 90% we get of people to reduce or stop their medications, particularly high blood pressure and diabetic medications in seven days. What do you do with these drugs? Don't throw them in the toilet. These are poisons that will 
will affect the fish and other sea life and the pollute your streams and lakes and oceans. And I'm serious. You need to take these drugs to your local pharmacy where they'll put them in a to toxic waste depot and dispose of them that way. Now, I, I, I wanna mention you really wanna be off medications. Sick people take medications. Healthy people don't. People who had lots of sickness, they have a checkerboard abdomen with the scars from their previous surgeries. Sick people, they have doctor's appointments, you know, every month or two or three. And they're the ones that support our local hospitals. Yes, they do. You don't want to be in that particular business. You wanna get out of the system, get out of the medical business. The only way I know that you can get out of your, get out of the medical business is to stop being ill to regain your health, to fix the problem, the problems of food. I mean, think about it for a minute. Doesn't it make sense? You don't want your best friend to be your doctor. I, mean, I don't want morticians in my life. I don't, I don't like it when I have lawyers working for me because I know I'm in trouble. Why would you want to have physicians as your best friends as somebody you have littered on your calendar to see Get out of the business. All right, let's talk about uh, dietary therapy. I told you about the drugs, told you the, the, the drawbacks of, of treating with medication. You really never get healthy. What you do is you temporize some of the problems, you treat the signs and symptoms, but you never get your health back. You're just an overweight, sick person carrying around a bag full of drugs. So to fix the problem, you gotta, to, You've got to fix the food. And uh, fixing the food means more than just lowering the sodium content of the food. You've got to change the entire diet. You've got to eat a starch-based diet. Probably the, the best uh, example that I can give you about how it's not the salt is to give you the example of the bacon. It's the pig that's making you sick. It's eating the pig. The only way they can get you to eat the pig because it's so disgusting is to load it with salt. We call this non-discretionary sodium intake. It's about 75% of the sodium you eat. You don't even have any choice. It's in your cheeses, in your meats, in your sausages, et cetera. That's how you get the sodium, but it's not really the salt. It's the, the vehicles that they're delivered to you and the things on your plate, the bacon, the cheese, et cetera. Now, let me show you how ineffective lowering salt intake is in terms of solving a blood pressure problem. Uh, in, as, in, as an average, a whole bunch of studies were put together and it was uh, determined how much lowering salt intake would have effect, an effect on your pressure. And so what the research showed, is, and again, it's based on many studies, is if you reduce uh, sodium intake by 1,725 milligrams down to 2,300 milligrams a day of sodium, which is what's recommended, that maneuver, which is to take about, oh, maybe three quarters of a teaspoon of salt out of your diet, that maneuver results in a reduction of the top number by one to five millimeters of mercury. Hardly detectable. And the bottom number by six tenths to three millimeters of mercury. Hardly even detectable. So if you're gonna focus on just salt out of your diet, you're not gonna solve the problem. You gotta get rid of the, of the, of the vehicles that the salt comes in. Like the bacon, you know, the roast beef, uh, anyway, uh, the, most, uh, the most impressive uh, low sodium diet experiment that was ever done was the, uh, the DASH diet. And doctors talk about this a lot, about the DASH diet. It's basically the Mediterranean diet uh, and they took the salt out of it. They fed uh, three levels of sodium intake, 3000 milligrams, 2400 milligrams and 1,500 milligrams. And again, what they saw just by variation of salt was only a tiny reduction in blood pressure. For those people who had significant high blood pressure, the drop was 11 over five millimeters mercury. 
for people who didn't have high blood pressure, taking that much salt of the diet, cutting it in half from 3,000 milligrams a day to 1,500 milligrams a day, the reduction of blood pressure was only five over three millimeters of mercury. You, you, your blood pressure varies that much when you get up or sit down or stub your toe. If you want to talk about the effect of, uh, of serious sodium restriction, we need to talk about Walter Kempner. You know, he's one of my mentors. He's one of my heroes. He's, he's the doctor that taught me how to practice diet therapy. He's a doctor who made me very comfortable about the foods that I, I, uh, I chose for you to eat. He's the doctor that showed me that diet therapy is the most powerful therapy that there is. Walter Kempner, he was an internist, came from Germany, worked at Duke University in Durham, North, North Carolina for 70 years. His results are amazing. Decreased heart size in patients, uh, stopped the loss of kidney function, improved their kidney function, cured diabetic retinopathy, cured essentially all of his type two diabetics. People who were in such severe heart failure that their heart was enlarged to the size of their chest cavity. He put them on the Kempner diet and get these people back living again. Well, he fed a very, very low salt diet. In fact, salt sodium was the big deal for Walter Kempner. His diet also happened to be vegan, high starch, low fat. What he, what he fed his patients as a therapeutic diet is he fed them a diet of white rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. If you were a really trim patient and you were at risk of losing weight on the Kempter diet, they would add as many as 2000 calories of sugar a day, white sugar to the diet. This was a 93% carbohydrate diet, carbohydrate coming from rice and fruit and fruit juice and sugar, very low fat diet. Walter Kempter, I hear, used to wash the white rice just to get some extra sodium off of it. His diet was far less than 500 milligrams of sodium a day, but the results were profound. Well, let me just tell you about the blood pressure results. He, he took care of, this was before the drug came in. Remember I told you the drugs were st first started in the late fifties. Well, Walter Kemper was the only game in town. People would come from all over the world to get the Kemper treatment. And he get people with malignant hypertension now, people are ready to have strokes and have, go into heart failure. They're really sick. And he put them on the Kempter diet and he got 60% of the patients to, to develop normal blood pressures just by feeding them the diet. You want to talk about lowering blood pressure profoundly, you do it with a Kempter approach. And that severe sodium restriction has a big effect on the cardiovascular system. Might not be all positive, but it has a big effect on it. And Walter Kempner was one of the first people who demonstrated reversal of artery disease. Remember through this lecture, I've talked to you about how the blood pressure, blood pressure goes up because the arteries are clogged. They're sick, they have atherosclerosis. Well, in addition to the lower sodium intake, his program cleaned out the arteries. As you see by this EKG, uh, the EKG, if you look at the far left side, you see what we call an ST depression. That means the heart muscle is not receiving enough blood flow. It's not getting enough oxygen. This, this dip right here, that's what it's, what it's telling us. And a normal would be the ST segment being upright. Well, look at this patient. You see in the left-hand side, the ST segments are reversed. This man has serious blockages of his arteries. And a few months later, you see that the ST segments are upright. So not only did Walter Kempner lower the blood pressure by severe sodium restriction, he made the arteries healthy again. And you can do that too. Well, let me tell you what we do at the McDougall program is we serve salt. We have salt shakers on the table. We don't put salt in the food because when you mix up the salt, in the super stew, the taste disappears. But we'll serve the super stew very low salt with a salt shaker there for you to put a little bit of salt on the surface of the food where your tongue tastes it. 
the basic McDougal diet is made of about 500 milligrams of sodium. If you add a half a teaspoon of salt a day, that's another 1100 milligrams of sodium. A half a teaspoon of salt on the surface of the food is a lot of taste. And now you've brought the sodium intake from the McDougal diet, 500 milligrams plus 1100 milligrams, you brought it up to 1600 milligrams a day. This is a very low sodium diet by most people's standards. If you have a massive heart attack and you end up in the intensive care unit at your hospital, their low to low sodium diet is 2000 milligrams of sodium, which is 400 milligrams in ours with a half a teaspoon of salt added to it. And boy, do we get results. Uh, you take care of, look at the people with high blood pressure. I showed you those on the DASH diet who had high blood pressure. Well, we get even better results than the DASH program. Starting with people who have blood pressures of 140 over 90, and most of these people are on medication. The drop in blood pressure is 18 over 11 millimeters of mercury. And most important for you to notice is that we took them off their blood pressure medications. In almost all cases, 90% of the people in our program studied over 10 years, 1,703 people, 90% of people were able to reduce or stop their blood pressure medications and their diabetic medications and most other medications just in seven days. So this summarize, this is my approach. If you came to see me with high blood pressure and I hope your doctors at least look at this as a possibility for caring for you. If the doctor didn't wanna do it or or you decided you didn't wanna go through this type of change, there are lots of doctors out there be very happy to, to give you drugs in the seven minute visit you have with them. It's a good business folks, pushing drugs. Believe me, I've been in this business long enough to know how to make money. So I put people on uh, the strict McDougal diet. And if uh, you're not overweight, this may include some nuts and seeds and avocados. If you're overweight, a well, weight loss is part of the reduction in blood pressure and the improvement in general health. So. I restrict the nuts and seeds and avocados. I allow you a half a teaspoon of salt on the surface of your food. But if you're not responding as rapidly as I'd like, I may ask you to cut the salt out completely, but that's a problem because that's what you like. You love the salt. If you're not enjoying the diet that we put you on or many other people put you on, it's because you're missing the salt. Just put the salt on the food and all of a sudden, voila, what a great recipe best soup I ever had, best stew I ever ate. Just put the salt on the food. We want you to eat the food. So you have high blood pressure? Well, let's just say you came in on a whole slew of drugs. I'm gonna switch you over to chlorothaladone because that's the drug that was tested that shows the benefits. Now the drugs lower blood pressure, but as far as reducing the risk of having a massive stroke or heart failure, it's only chlorothaladone that's been tested and shows benefits. So I'm gonna use chlorothaladone and I won't have to use much. You know, the 10 milligram tablets, I might have to have you split them in half. And you'll take that medication to lower the blood pressure down to uh, maybe 160 over 100. That's when you initiate drug therapy. You remember the British guidelines said so, the Cochrane collaboration said so, and probably the Joint Commission said so too. So if you run a higher blood pressure than 160 over 100, I'll put you on a little bit of chlorothaladone. Hopefully I'll be able to stop the other medications. And I'll treat you with uh, medication with the goal of getting your blood pressure down to, uh, let's say 140 over 85. I, I gave you a range here, 130 to 150 over 80 to 90. Well, that's a tough job to monitor the blood pressure and get it to this in such a narrow range. I'll tell you, that's difficult. I'll adjust your medications every four to seven days. See how you do, give you a chance on this dose. Likely you're gonna require fewer drugs after four to seven days. Monitor your blood pressure at home. You'll check it and you'll give me the results. I'm not gonna to go to your house. I mean, we do in the telemedicine program, we go to your house pretty much by the internet, but uh, you're gonna bring me a list of blood pressures and we're gonna make decisions based upon the blood pressures you've got for the previous week. And it, it takes time, you know, you, 
most of the time we get people, as I said, 90% of people, we reduce or stop their medications in seven days, but sometimes it takes a little longer. And you shouldn't really give up being drug free and normal blood pressure until you've lost all the excess body fat. So you get down to trim body weight. Now I have to say there are some occasions, I can't really remember when they were because they weren't very, very many over my 50 plus years of practicing medicine. There are probably a couple of patients I had to add some of the other medications to in addition to chlorothaladone. But like I say, so few, I can't even remember. Well, that's what I think you should know about high blood pressure. And that's the way I'd like to see your doctors treat you. You're welcome to show them my presentation. If you're not getting cooperation because the doctor just doesn't want to learn new things or has a, a, a cooperative patient load and doesn't need to have somebody as disruptive as you are, if you want us to care for you, we run a 12-day telemedicine program. And you can be in Ukraine and Shanghai and Sydney, and we don't care where you are any place in the world. We'll come to you via the internet. And we have people right now from all over the world who are in our 12-day program. And our doctors will, will do histories and physicals on you. They'll give you, it's Dr. Lim right now that primarily does this. We'll give you advice very similar to what I just shared with you with the goal of getting you off the medications and getting your health back. Now we can do this big dent in your progress in 12 days uh, in the internet <clears throat> telemedicine program that we're running now. And you can find that on the website, drmcdougall.com.